Have you ever wondered what kind of strange magic goes on behind the curtains of your digital audio workstation's graphic interface? Have you ever wanted to know just what the purpose of a digital audio workstation is, or how DAWs evolved in today's marvels of audio production? In this video, we're going to take a look at the inner workings of the modern digital audio workstation. We'll explore some of the history of the DAW, and then dive into the nuts and bolts of modern DAW signal processing to better understand how music gets from conception to reality. By the end of this video, you'll have a much better understanding of DAW workflow, which will help you make better home recordings. Ready to get started? Someone hit record. Hi kids, my name is Merlin and I'd like to welcome you to Better Home Recordings. Today, we're looking at the Digital Audio Workstation, the now basic audio tool that has evolved into the most important piece of gear that anyone who records audio can have in their arsenal, from the home recordist all the way to the big super studios of today. In the not so distant past of analog recording, recording studios use large format mixing consoles to process incoming signals. Vocals keyboards, guitars, bass, drums, and so on. Those signals were then sent to an analog multi-track tape recorder, with each instrument or input generally being routed to its own track on the tape recorder. Once everything was recorded, the signal path was reversed, and the recorded signals coming from the analog multi-track tape recorder were sent to the individual input channels on the mixing console. The signals were then mixed together using the console's channel faders, seasoned to taste with EQ and outboard compression effects, with the final mix being sent to a two-track stereo tape recorder. When digital audio first arrived, most of the existing analog signal path, including consoles, outboard gear, and the like, were still utilized. The multi-track digital tape recorder replaced the analog recorder in the signal chain. Although digital recorders recorded a very clean and quiet signal, they still had the same limitations as analog tape recorders in that they were challenging to edit when needed, and a very limited number of tracks were available. 32 for most pro digital machines of the time. Large format analog console manufacturers such as Solid State Logic and Neve started adding things like compression and noise gates to their internal channel signal paths, eliminating the need for their outboard analog equivalents, which saved both time and money and was very cool. As cool as this was though, the consoles still had to route their signals to and from external digital audio tape recorders with their aforementioned linear challenges and limited track count still intact. As computer programmers got more involved in the audio industry, it wasn't long before a new software tool called the Digital Audio Workstation started showing up in recording studios around the world. Digital audio workstations basically combined the entire recording chain from input signal processing all the way to the multi-track recorder into one piece of software. The recorded audio signals were then stored directly on the host computer's hard drive. Because of the non-linear way that computers store their data, this opened up a whole new world of audio editing possibilities on the computer. Previously, both analog and digital audio tape could be extremely challenging to edit should a producer wish to, for example, change the arrangement of a song after it had already been recorded. In the analog world, it meant taking huge chunks of tape and physically moving them to another section of the master tape reel and reassembling the sections. This was very time consuming, especially if the edit didn't work creatively and the whole thing had to be put back together in its original order. Now, with digital editing in a DAW, we can edit in a non-destructive way to our heart's content. The original audio file is left intact and proxy edits tell the computer which portion of the master audio file to play and when to play it. This has allowed us to get extremely creative in our approach to producing songs, from simple editing of words and phrases in a vocal, for example, to the building of extremely complex beats and arrangements as we build and edit our masterpieces. On the DAW screen, each track is represented by a horizontal timeline in the interface, which scrolls from left to right as the song is played. The beginning of a track is on the left, and the ending of the track is on the right. The sound from each track is represented by vertical waves, along the horizontal timeline wherever audio signal occurs. This is where the non-linear editing and arranging part comes in. You can move, rearrange, or even delete an entire track on the timeline. You can change the beginning, midsection, or ending, and can even copy and paste various parts Hey, just like your favorite word processor! to create the desired sound, arrangement, or effect you're looking for. Nothing is lost as the original recorded files are still on your computer's hard drive and are easily restored should you need them. 
Since DAWs were designed to emulate the standard signal flow of an analog mixing console, let's take a look at the signal path of an analog recording session versus the same session recorded digitally. Here in the analog world, your audio source, a vocal mic or instrument mic for example, plugs into the analog console's input slash preamplifier section. In the DAW world, you plug your source into your computer's audio interface. Most audio interfaces have at least one microphone preamplifier. In both cases, this is where you control the signal's input level. Next, we come to the analog console's EQ and insert section. The hardware points used for things like outboard compression, noise gates, and the like. In the DAW world, we have the insert slash plug-in section. Here, we generally use software emulations of EQ or other signal processors. We refer to these emulations as plug-ins due to the way that they can be plugged in to the signal path. Plugins come in many varieties. There are plugins that emulate EQs, dynamics, pitch correction, filtering, imaging, modulation effects, reverbs, delays, and even emulations of entire channel strips from famous analog consoles from companies like Solid State Logic and Neve. Next we have the bus or auxiliary sends. These work the same way in both analog and digital worlds. They are used for routing audio signals to subgroups or to buses used for things such as reverb and delay. And finally, we have the fader section. The faders control each channel's output level to the master bus. This is basically the same in both analog and digital realms. This section generally also features a mute button, which, as the name implies, allows you to turn off a channel's output and a solo button, which allows you to isolate the channel and listen solely to that channel's output. Traditionally, large format traditionally, large format analog traditionally, large format traditionally, large format <laughs> Oh my god. Traditionally, large format analog consoles include a routing section that allows you to send the incoming signal to a specific channel or track on the multi-track tape recorder. In a DAW, you simply create a track and then specify which preamplifier input of your audio interface or which software instrument in the case of a MIDI track supplies the signal to the track. Let's take a look at MIDI. Up to now, we've been looking at the similarities between analog mixing consoles and digital audio workstations with regard to how they handle audio signals. But there was a protocol called MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface, being developed in the early 80s that allowed hardware-based sequencers, either in keyboard form or standalone boxes, to communicate with other pieces of hardware like synthesizers and drum machines through a MIDI interface. In the mid-80s, companies such as Steinberg and Yamaha started developing software versions of MIDI sequencers. In 1985, Pro 16 from Steinberg was the first software-based MIDI sequencer commercially produced. By 1989, it had evolved into Cubase, which is still around in DAW form today. MIDI sequencers utilize what's called a piano roll interface for programming and playing back digital instruments and samples. If you're familiar with an old time piano player, you will immediately understand what piano roll means. In a player piano, a series of holes punched into a paper roll activate the keys of the piano as the roll moves along in order to play back a song. In a MIDI sequencer, the paper roll is replaced with an electronic version that features note impulses or virtual holes in the virtual paper. These impulses can be programmed with various parameters such as note length, note velocity, volume, program changes, and much more. Around that same time, digital audio started to come of age. In 1990, DigiDesign released the first digital audio editor called Sound Tools. It was a stereo editor that featured non-destructive editing, which was a true breakthrough at the time. A year later, they released a four-track version of the software and called it Pro Tools. As you may know, Pro Tools has since become the industry standard digital audio workstation. At the same time that Pro Tools and other digital audio editors were being developed, a company named Opcode became the first company to marry MIDI sequencing and digital audio capabilities in a software program they called Studio Vision. Studio Vision was the first recording application to offer both audio and MIDI recording and editing in one package. Other companies eventually followed suit, and many of those programs have since evolved into the fully-featured DAWs that we have today. 
In the analog world, the focus is generally on recording audio signals and mixing the various tracks into a presentable song. Now, with the inclusion of MIDI sequencing in our DAWs, we have a total unique tool that allows us to not only record and mix audio, but also allows us to utilize thousands upon thousands of virtual instruments and effects for building beats and composing songs. As you become more familiar with the various DAWs available, you'll find that some DAWs focus on audio. Pro Tools is a great example of this, while others focus on software instruments and MIDI programming. Logic and Digital Performer are two of these. This is not to say that Pro Tools is bad at MIDI programming and software instruments. It isn't. Or that Logic or Digital Performer are not good at recording audio. They aren't. But just to point out that each DAW will tend to have its own focus. Which DAW you choose depends highly upon what your ultimate goal is. Will you just be recording and mixing audio signals? Or will you be creating beats and producing songs that feature a variety of software instruments? Keep these things in mind when choosing a DAW. Hey, let's talk about mixing. Now that you've recorded and edited your instrument and MIDI music tracks, a digital audio workstation will serve as a mixer so that you can change the levels of individual tracks as needed to present a clean, well-balanced mix. As you can see, the mixer in a digital audio workstation very much resembles a real-life analog mixer. This serves a couple of different purposes. The first is because most analog mixers are laid out in a very logical fashion where the signal flow is easy to track just by looking at the mixer channel strips. Secondly, it makes it much easier for engineers transitioning from real-world analog consoles to the digital world as the concepts are exactly the same. In the mixer, you can add equalization to each track in order to enhance its sound and to give it a place to sit sonically in the mix. You can also add ambient effects via plugins such as reverb and delay to give your mix a sense of width and space. To further this width and space, you can use the channel's pan control to place an instrument or vocal in the stereo field. Equalization, or EQ, is generally applied in the track's insert section. Ambient effects can either be put in the track's insert section, or you can send multiple tracks to one ambient effect, such as a single reverb for all vocals by using an auxiliary bus that has the effect unit applied to the aux channel's insert section, as you can see here. The mixer's tracks are then summed to the master stereo output bus. Here, you can add additional processing in the form of plugins as needed. For example, this is where you might put a compressor to be used for stereo bus compression, which is a trick originally from the analog world that most engineers still use in the digital one. You could also add plugins like EQ, stereo widening, or a mastering limiter in the bus's insert section for overall sweetening of your final mix. From the master stereo bus, your mix can be bounced to a stereo audio file, which then becomes your master recording. It can generally be in whatever file format you require for various situations. An uncompressed wave or AIFF file for sending to a mastering engineer, or including on a CD for instance, or a compressed file such as an MP3, AAC, or similar for uploading to streaming services, websites, etc. And that brings us to our Better Home Recording Super Tip of the Day. Learning how to use a digital audio workstation could be a daunting prospect. Don't be intimidated though. The learning curve can be steep, but it's also extremely rewarding once you've learned the basics. Stick with it. In time, you will learn the ins and outs of your DAW and will learn to master the finer points and intricacies of music production. There's always room to grow and to become better at your craft. I've been doing this for too many years to count and I am still learning every day. It's something I've really come to look forward to as a matter of fact. My dad said you're never too old to learn. So I guess I've proven that point. And there we have it, a look at the history and inner workings of the modern digital audio workstation. I hope you've gained a better appreciation and understanding of what a DAW is, how it works, and how you can use one to create better home recordings. I'm so glad you stopped by today. If you have any questions on anything discussed in this video or would like to suggest a subject for a future video, please leave a comment down below. I would love to hear from you. That's it for now, kids. I hope to see you again soon. And remember, the first rule of Better Home Recordings is there are no rules. Be sure to check out my other videos that you'll find useful for your home studio here. And please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more fun and information. I would very much appreciate your continued support. See you soon.